you. Thank you very much uh, for the warm uh, welcome. Thank you for making the effort of being here uh, tonight. Thank you for the organizers. Uh, a special thank to Dr. Ziad, who is responsible more than anyone else for me being here. And thank you, Yasmin, for, for your introduction. It makes it easier for me uh, to delve directly into the topic. Sorry? Uh, no, I'm OK standing. I'm, uh, I'm 70 years old, but I can still stand. <laughs> Um, I speak slowly, not because I'm 70 years old. <laughs> I speak slowly because the translators need some time to translate. And uh, yes, give them uh, their due uh, gratitude. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It is important to understand that between 1850 and 1882, or even eight, 1900, that is the last, the second half of the 19th century, Palestine was a pastoral place. Many people were peasants, living in rural countryside. But there also was a very uh, thriving and active uh, urban life. There was an urban elite, a political elite, a social elite, a cultural elite, and of course, an economic elite. Palestine in the next, in the last half of the 19th century, like the rest of the Eastern Mediterranean and other parts of the Arab world, were going through a renaissance, continuing something we called in Arabic al-Nahda. This was a flow of energy, of poetry, theater, literature, philosophy, an attempt by people who could write, by people who could compose, by people who could draw, to try and help the society to become better, more peaceful, and able to deal with new challenges that modernization brought to that part of the world. Not one of those people who lived in Jerusalem, or Jaffa, or Haifa, and their colleagues with whom they cooperated and collaborated in Alexandria, Cairo, Beirut, Damascus. This was all part of the same cultural uh, milieu and political milieu. None of them was aware that at that very period, the second half of the 19th century, very important people in Britain and in the United States in particular were discussing their fate, the fate of their country, the fate of the people living in that country, and connected their fate to a problem they had nothing to do with. There isn't such example in history for what happened to the Palestinians. A small people, not a large group of people, living peacefully, totally in their natural environment, and in corridors of power in Washington and in London, also in Berlin and in Paris, People discuss their fate 
without, of course, talking to them. And the reason that people discuss the fate of the Palestinians in the second half of the 19th century is that Europe has a problem with its Jewish people. Nothing to do with the Palestinians. It's incredible. And you have an obsession in Europe with the future of the Jews, which leads to an obsession with the future of Palestine. And if you think about logically, there should not be any connection between the two. This is Europe that reaches the 20th century with the idea of socialism, liberalism, democracy, also fascism, that's true. But none of that should concern the people who live in Palestine. And yet, unaware of that, they are a very important topic in the discussion in especially Britain and the United States, but not only there, of the future of the Jewish people. And it's a very curious mixture of who is involved in this conversation that I'm trying to reconstruct in my new book. On the one hand, you have a very important group of evangelical Christians who hold very important positions in Britain and the United States. Some of them hold even positions of a prime minister, a foreign minister, a president in the United States, a Supreme Court judge in the United States, members of the economic elite and legal elite in the United States. What unites these people is a belief that if the Jews of the West, but especially the Jews of the East, the Jews of Russia, the Jews of Romania, the Jews of Bulgaria, especially the Jews in the East, if the Jews in the East would be directed to Palestine from a theological evangelical view, this movement of the Jews to Palestine will be an indication for the beginning of a new religious program, the program of bringing back Jesus Christ, resurrecting the death, and the beginning of the end of time. According to their ideas of evangelical Christianity, the Jews had a role to play in beginning the end of time. And the role was to go to Palestine and there to convert to Christianity, and if not, to be shish kebab or barbecued in hell. For the anti-Semitic among the evangelical Christians, this was even more than just a program to fulfill a prophecy that they thought they read either in the Old or the New Testament. It was a pure anti-Semitic impulse. If the Jews go to Palestine, they're not in Europe. Simple. And if, in return, you get the only Jew you want, Jesus Christ, then it's a double bill. <laughs> the evangelical Christians some of them were not anti-Semitic. Some of them really thought that the Jews were a different race, a different nation, uh, that deserved to have a nation state. So you can see a mixture of even contradicting attitudes toward the Jews, but are united by the idea that the best way to deal with Jews in Europe, and in particular in Central and Eastern Europe, is by directing them to Palestine. They would have remained an unimportant group in the end of the day had they not been united with other people with important positions in Britain and the United States that began to think that this idea that did not begin as a Jewish idea. 
as I said, it began as an evangelical Christian idea, actually looked attractive to them as well. Let me explain who they are, who they were. Many of the leaders of the Jewish communities in the West, in Germany, in Italy, in France, in Britain, in the United States, were aware that particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, in those last 50 years of the 19th century, there's a new wave of anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism in those 50 years had a lot to do with the rise of romantic nationalism. A lot of groups and even bigger nations fell in love with the idea of romantic nationalism. The romantic nationalism was a very racist idea. People are born into a nation. They cannot leave the nation. And if nobody, and no, not everyone could join the nation. And the purer, the more pure, the purer the nation is, the more successful it will be. And the romantic nationalists in this country, in Germany, had a lot of historians who told them without any proof that Germany, or whatever was Germany in the past, was particularly successful when it was pure when it had no foreign or alien elements in it. And there was similar movement in France and in Italy. And therefore, they needed to show an act of purification in order to say there is a new kind of nationalism. So how do you prof purify German nationalism? You point to the people you think who are not echt Deutsch, not really German, the Jews. Now, the fear of the Jews in Britain and the United States in particular was that the rise of romantic nationalism in Russia, in Germany, in many other parts of Europe would push the Eastern European Jews, which they used to call Ostjuden, the East European Jews, into the West, into Britain, into the United States. And many leaders of the Jewish communities in Britain and in the United States joined the evangelical Christians by saying, we don't want these Jews here. We don't want people in Britain and the United States to identify us with these Jews. And if you go a bit later into the late 19th century, these Jews, some of them are also subscribing to socialism, Bolshevism, so the fear from them is even greater. Not just that they are poor, but they also have revolutionary uh, ideas. So very important Jews join evangelical Christians, most of whom were anti-Semites, by saying, in order not for these Jews to come to the West, we will send them to Palestine. And this coincides with a group that was a minority group among the Jews in the East, who began to think that the best way to fight anti-Semitism is to make Judaism a romantic national movement. And if Jewish identity is romantic nationalist, like the German one, it needs a country. You need a homeland if you have a nation. And interestingly enough, those Jews did not immediately think of Palestine. Some of them were willing to think of other parts of the world. But the evangelical Christians pressured them not to give up the idea that the only way to turn Jews from being members of a religion to becoming member of a new romantic national collective is by settling in Palestine. Even the leader of the Zionist movement was willing to consider Uganda in Africa. But the majority of the leaders of the Zionists said, no, we want to create a new Jew, a new Jewish national movement in Palestine. It would be wrong to think that at that moment, the people who were planning the so-called return of the Jews to Palestine, 
as a solution for anti-Semitism, it would be wrong to think that they didn't know that there were other people living in Palestine. They knew. They knew exactly that Palestine was not an empty land. They knew that the Palestinians were there undergoing, like the rest of the area, processes of modernization, their own ideas of nationalism, and that this was a thriving, normal society of people. They knew because Britain, Prussia, uh, Austro-Hungary, Austro uh, United States, all of them in the second half of the 19th century had consuls in Jerusalem, had missionaries in Palestine. They knew exactly that Palestine was a place, a living place, with living people. So why did they support an idea of solving the problem of the Jews in Europe, knowing that the only way of doing it in Palestine is by displacing the Palestinians. They talked openly about this connection. If we don't want the Jews in Europe and we send them to Palestine, we will move the Palestinians and make space for the Jews. From very early on, this was part of the project. Why? Why is it part of the project? Because of what we used to call Orientalism, namely the people in the West did not regard people living in the East as equals, as equal human beings with the same aspiration, with the same uh, right to life, to nation, to independence, to self-determination because of Islamophobia, and because it was far more important to get rid of the Jews than to care about the fate of the Palestinians. And we have to remember this today, because from the very beginning, it is very clear that the whole notion of the project, and remember, I'm talking about 90 years before the Holocaust. It has nothing to do with the Holocaust. 90 years before the Holocaust, the notion that a racist Europe that doesn't want to have Jews in it is willing to help the Jews from Europe to displace the Palestinian and replace them. <coughs> it's incredible if you think about it. And a lot of good people on both sides of the Atlantic and also in Europe itself were wondering whether this is morally valid. In fact, they were not even sure that this was politically valid because in the whole of the 19th century, in fact, until the outbreak of the First World War, Palestine was not part of Europe. It was part of the Ottoman Empire. So it even didn't look realistic. What is incredible, and I try to show in the book, how the crucial moment for Palestine and the Palestinians, again, without anyone in Palestine knowing it, which really boggles the mind, that you have these Palestinians sitting in the cities, in the countryside, in the countryside, not knowing even during the First World War that their fate was actually already decided in the very crucial years between 1915 and 1917, Palestine is no more part of the Ottoman Empire. It becomes part of the British Empire. And the big question that Britain has asked, has to ask itself, do I want a Palestine that is part of an Arab world under British control? Or do I want, as the Zionist movement is trying to push me, to take Palestine out of the Arab world, make it part of Europe, and create a European Jewish state in the Middle East? And that's when the Zionist lobby really becomes powerful. Between 1915 and 1917, it was not difficult to convince Britain 
to include Palestine in the new British Empire. It was difficult to convince Britain that the best thing for Britain is that Palestine would be Jewish and European. And they succeeded because there were enough anti-Semites in Britain, there were enough anti-Semite Jews in Britain who said, we need the Jews from Russia to go to Palestine. God forbid they will come to London. And this is something that uh, eventually brought something you all know about, the Balfour Declaration, when Britain produces this unbelievable document that promises something that did not belong to Britain and gave it to someone it didn't belong to, the Zionist movement. And yet, even in the first 30 years of British rule in Palestine, the Zionist movement was not strong enough, contrary to what historians write. The Zionist movement was not strong enough to take over Palestine. We have to remember this. One of the reasons the Palestinian leaders and politicians were surprised in the Nakba in 1948 was that objectively they looked at the Jewish community in Palestine of the settlers who were one third of the population and they looked at the Arab world around them and they said these people will not defeat us. When the British would leave, Palestine would be for the Palestinians Iraq would be for the Iraqis, Syria would be for the Syrians, and Lebanon would be for the Lebanese. It looked logical, it looked possible. Again, not understanding, and I don't blame them, I'm not sure I would have understood, that again there was already a powerful Christian and Jewish lobby that made sure that these facts on the ground didn't count. They were not important. What was important that the new superpower of the world, the United States, were now convinced, like Britain before, that when Britain leaves Palestine, Palestine cannot be for the Palestinians. It has to be a Jewish state. Unfortunately, the Soviet Union supported this idea as well. Now, if you have, during the Cold War, when the two superpowers in Berlin are fighting each other, and they agree about only one thing. You know, the Soviet Union and the United States did not agree about anything. They were fighting in Korea, they were fighting in Berlin, they were fighting in Latin America, they were fighting everywhere. In half an hour, they agreed about the fate of Palestine, that it should be a Jewish state. Unbelievable, if you think about it. And I keep thinking about the Palestinians. Even if they had the best leadership in the world, even if they were the best army in the world, how can they face an international coalition of the two superpowers that says, for whatever reasons, and the reasons are not always the same reasons, there has to be a Jewish state in Palestine. And even then, after the Nakba, after the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, Israel is not a safe place because some leaders in the Arab world are not accepting the idea that Palestinians should be displaced and become refugees, are worried about a Jewish state that uses aggressive language, and it's very clear is not happy with taking over only 80% of Palestine as it did in 1948, leaders like Jamal Abdel Nasser and leaders of the Ba'as in Syria. So, it was still, from an objective point of view, a colonialist project in the heart of the Arab world at the time that the Arab world was fighting against colonialism. We have to remember, this is the period that the Egyptians kick out the British. The Algerians kick out the French. It was possible to prevent, objectively, the Jewish state. But again, the lobby. That's why I wrote this book. The lobby is so powerful that it connects the interests of politicians, e uh, economic elites, cultural elites, the beginning of military industry, even socialist leaders in Germany, in Britain, the Democratic Party in the United States, 
political institution that supposedly in those days talked the language of decolonization, talked the language of human rights and civil rights. You should look at the documents as I did of the British Labour Party in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. One of the most important mission of the Labour Party in Britain is the security of Israel. Not to mention the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in the United States. And again, you understand that this is, one day is going to blow up. It's, it's impossible because it's not only an abstract idea, a Jewish state instead of the Palestinian. It's a reality of dispossession, of ethnic cleansing, and an anti-colonialist struggle by the Palestinians. It's true that the Palestinian National Movement in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s did not liberate even one square inch of Palestine. That is true. But we should remember that against this global alliance that decided that the Palestinians have no right for Palestine, which is an incredible idea if you think about it, under that kind of alliance, the success of the liberation movement was to say, no, we are here. We are still Palestinians. Yes, we don't have Palestine, but we are here. We are not giving up. And after 1967, suddenly more people in the world wake up and say, wait a minute, now that it's easier to know what's going on, because there is television and there is the occupation of the West Bank and the occupation of the Gaza Strip, people begin to know a little bit more what, how does this idea that this powerful global alliance support translate to the experience of the Palestinians. There was very little knowledge in the world. It was not anti-Palestinian. There was just not knowledge in the world. What does it mean to be a Palestinian in Palestine from the beginning of the moment that the Zionist movement is in Palestine? Very few people uh, understood it and knew it. But after 1967, and that's what also was so interesting for me, Every year from 1967 until today, and you know it even yourself, even if you are younger, that every year that passes, there is more and more clear evidence that Israel oppresses the Palestinians, dispossesses them, violates every basic civil and human rights of the Palestinians. That the essence of the Zionist project is to oppress the Palestinians, because they are still there, despite the ethnic cleansing of 1948, and that the Israeli army and secret service and the police and the government, whoever is there, has to be busy every day in forcing millions of people to live a life they don't want. This is, this is what Israel is all about from a Palestinian perspective. I'm not saying that there are no other aspects for Israel. They did some brilliant things as well, no doubt. I don't, I don't want this historical picture to be one-dimensional. But from a Palestinian perspective, as the late Edward Said used to say, Zionism was only bad news. There was nothing positive in this ideology that says Palestine is not for the Palestinians, it has to be a Jewish state. But this was translated more and more into the oppression of the Palestinians. And as the Palestinian resistance grew, the oppression became more cruel, more uh, uh, ruthless, more inhuman. What happened in the last year shouldn't have surprised anyone who saw how, from 1948, you have these two parallel developments the Palestinians become more and more resistant to the oppression, and the Israelis become more and more inhuman and cruel in their reaction. And that's what we have seen in the last year. And my question I asked in the last bit of my book, when all this information is there, the information that because of this most of the young people are here today, when all the information is there, it's not a complicated information. It's basic knowledge about people, millions of people, 
who cannot go to school, who cannot do, go to the work, can be imprisoned without trial. Their houses can be demolished. They can be executed at the will of the army. They can be expelled at the will of the government. When all this is so clear and transparent and known, especially in the age of the internet and the alternative media, how come Israel still has the immunity? How come it is still regarded the only democracy in the Middle East? When it's clearly an apartheid state, when it's clearly an occupying power, when it's clearly a colonizing power, it's clearly an ethnic cleansing power. And the book tries to understand how does a lobby succeed in societies, and I especially chose Britain and the United States, but it would be true for Germany as well, societies that proud themselves of being democracies, where there is open information, there's no censorship, there is respect for human rights, there is respect for civil rights. How in these two societies, when the reality is so clearly in front of our eyes, they still, when they are in the government, when they are in the mainstream media, the mainstream academia, reject the reality. Either they claim that they don't know, which is not true, or they describe a reality that does not exist, but they find it more and more difficult because the number of people who are normal, <laughs> who have a modicum of decency in them in the world says, wait a minute, if we support human rights, if we support civil rights, if we are against oppression, if we are against colonialism, if we are against racism, of course we are siding with the Palestinians. What else can we do? Right? Right. And then we ask ourselves, why our politicians are not behaving like us? Why other, our academics do not behave like us? Why our journalists, I'm talking about the mainstream journal, I know there's some good journalists here today. Why are the journalists do not see it? They don't have eyes, they, they're not visiting the place, do they? Is there another Palestine maybe that we don't know of? Especially when you hear German academics, you think there is another Palestine, for sure. For sure there's another Palestine. And yes, it comes back to, to lobbying and advocacy. And you have to understand this, this lobbying machine is more than 100 years old and has a lot of experience. I'm talking now in Britain and the United States, but I'm sure it's true about other parts where it's effective. It has 100 years of, of, of experience. It is working day and night for a cause. Yes, an immoral cause, an unreasonable cause, and a cause that will not succeed in the end of the day. But nonetheless, they have a, yeah, yeah, they're not going to succeed. Unjust projects, in the end, I can tell you as an historian, do not succeed. Do not succeed. And, and therefore, uh, you can see that it is money, power, intimidation, fear, and fabrication. But it's not a one-day project. It's a 100-year project, and therefore, it is so effective. But it's so encouraging for me to know that it doesn't work on the society as a whole. It doesn't. And that brings me to think about the gap between the world of our politicians and our world. I don't know how we came to this moment in history, and I'm talking now generally, in democracies and non-democracies. I don't remember a period in history when politicians were of such low caliber. 
I don't know about you. Self-centered, totally immersed in their own careers, thinking about the electorate only as a base for being re-elected, talking nonsense about the problems that they're supposed to solve, not even trying to solve these problems, and just thinking, will I be elected next time because the salary is good, I have my own driver. Did you ever see the salaries in the European Parliament? <laughs> Only football players like Ronaldo can, can match them. This is something we have to think about. This gap between the agenda that politicians are leading and our agenda as, as, as human beings, as a society. And I will finish by saying there is a direct, there is a direct link between our ability in Germany, in India, in Pakistan, in Congo, everywhere, in Argentina, I know some people from Chile here, uh, we, it's, it depends, our ability to change the essence of politics, to begin to have politicians that respond to what we care about, whether it's global warming, whether it's poverty, whether it's the basic services that the state has to give us and not take from us. The more we are successful in this uh, direction, the better the chances for Palestine to be free. There is a direct, there is direct link between a change in the way we do politics and the foreign policies of governments, and the foreign policies of governments and how they react to Israel and to Palestine. I wish I could tell you the Palestinians can themselves liberate Palestine and defeat Zionism. Unfortunately, this is not the balance of power. I wish I could tell you, well, with the help of the Arab world, Palestine would be free. I'm sorry, the Arab world has rulers, it doesn't have leaders. I wish, I wish I could have said it. But I do know, I do know that we are not giving up on morality in politics, in values of humanity in politics, and we have to be immune to the nonsense that political scientists, especially in this country, but I saw it elsewhere as well, tell us, don't be naive. Politics has nothing to do with morality. It's all about power. You are young people. One day you will be grown up and you will understand that politics is about cynicism, manipulation, and power. No, no, it, it is, but it doesn't have to be. And of course, Palestine is the one place where Anyway, there is not yet a state. There is not yet a country that is ruled by political elites. It's no wonder that we all hope, and I believe that this hope is valid, that it's not just about ending the oppression of the Palestinians. It's not just ending the colonialism, the apartheid, and the genocide. It is also building a society, and I'm not talking about ideal society, but a society that learns from all the failures. For example, the bad example of South Africa today. This is not the most successful decolonization in economic terms, what happens in South Africa. Decolonization in Africa is not everywhere a success story. Definitely decolonization in the Arab world is not something that we are all proud of, even if the, we, uh, the people kicked out the colonial powers. Palestine has this ability to learn from all these failures and build something that is not only decolonized, but also better than the other decolonization examples we have. And I think that's why for so many people, whether there are teachers in Argentina uh, demonstrating for the rise of uh, salaries, whether there are indigenous people in Canada and the First Nations asking for the rights, whether they are workers or minorities, they all wave the Palestinian flag because it's the flag of justice. And we should remember it in Germany. <laughs> and
And if you feel in Germany that you are a minority, remember that you are a majority in the world. That's very important. You are not a minority. And because, and because of that, with all the power of the lobby, with all the power of the government that support Israel, with all the government of the military industry that supports Israel, where the military industry in Germany plays a very crucial role that would, a lot of Germans would regret many years from now for the role they played on the wrong side of history here. For the, all the power of the high-tech uh, industry, the security industry, the financial industry, for all that power, it seems that this project of Zionism is not working. If anything we learned from the last year was that Z the State of Israel was a building with a lot of cracks in it. And what the uh, events of the 7th of October did, it gave a strong blow to the shaky building. And it's even shakier than it was. I don't like collapse of states. I'm not fond of disintegration. I can see what happens in Syria. I can see what happens in Libya. I'm not looking forward for a total chaos in Israel. But I do look forward for an historical process by which a disintegration, a failure of a project, would be replaced by a much better one. One that the Palestinians deserve to have after 120 years in which every basic of their rights, every basic rights they had was violated and not respected, not only by Israel, but by so many powerful people and states and organizations, especially in the world that prides itself of being the democratic world. So I would say to you, yeah. so I would say to you, you are facing in Germany the lobby that I'm writing about in Britain and in the United States. But also in Britain and in the United States, this lobby has limits. This lobby does not know how to deal with civil society. It doesn't know how to deal with conscientious people. It doesn't know how to deal with brave people. So be brave, be conscientious, and remember you are on the right side of history, and no lobby in the world will take it away from you. Thank you. Okay. 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 Okay.